Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. I'm so happy you're here. Of course, my name is Bryce, and I'm here. I'm joined with my two friends, Stephanie and Emmy. We will have links, or I will have links to their channels down in the description box below. And we wanted to do, we actually planned this show yesterday because we wanted to do a little touch, quick little touch up, touch base, whatever, with where we are, because I don't know about you guys. And with Stephanie, we've been texting a lot. We both are feeling like I want to laugh and I want to cry at the same time. Yeah. I have the feeling like I want to run, but I don't know where I want to run to. It's like I'm excited, but I'm also anxious. And um, I think that this has a lot to do with a lot of things. First of all, we've all been on a roller coaster of the last couple of years waiting for stuff to happen. And finally, it, it kind of feels like we're kind of holding our breath because it looks like things are actually happening. But I know a lot of people don't want to get their hopes up. Um, but we're also looking at some crazy astrological things going on, which Emmy is going to talk about as well. And of course, Tamara did her astrological stuff as well. And I think they're both matching up pretty, pretty heavily. But before we get into the nitty gritty of what's happening, I we were just chit chatting off camera about the obelisk that was struck. Um, and I can't remember, I forgive me, I can't remember which country it was in where it was struck. And I just want to clarify again, you guys that there are some obelisks out there that have been used for negative reasons to harness negative energy, but not all the obelisks are bad. The obelisk is not Osiris's male wand. I don't know if I can say the P word on YouTube. So it's not, that is fake news. That is fake news put out there meant to divide us. The obelisk, if you do your research, instead of just listening to people, what people are telling you, including us, if you do your research, the original purpose of the obelisk was to represent your spine, Shashumna, where Kundalini rises, and it's an energy antenna. And so as above, so below, as the micro, so the macro. They, in Tartaria and Atlantis and in Egypt, they use these obelisks to harness energy. Energy can be good, used for both the good and the bad. The obelisk in Washington, D.C., Stephanie and I felt wonderful around it. It felt very healing, right? And so we, and we were just talking about this. We cannot, we have to stop it. Stop it. Stop repeating fake news, first of all, because you don't know who these people are that are telling you this. And 90% of the truthers are infiltrators. So stop it. Do your own research. Second of all, stop black and white thinking. Right? Black and white thinking is a sign of a mental disorder. We have to think in shades of gray. The darkness cannot create anything. Photosynthesis, this is just simple science. Darkness cannot create anything. Only the light can. So everything that existed, existed in the realm of light before it was stolen and inverted, including the snake. We were just talking about this. The snake is not bad. It's not bad. Kundalini is not bad. Kundalini is Christ consciousness. They're the same thing. Do your research. They're the same thing. So if you're saying Kundalini is bad, you're, you're walking away from the Christ consciousness as well. Okay. All right. Would you tell God, source creator, that the snake is bad? The, the, the creator that created the snake or the owl or the goat? These animals didn't pick to be used as mascots for evil. It's what you do with the symbolism. It's what you do with the energy. Yeah. As the conduit or as, as a human being, what are you using it? Are you using it to polarize negative or positive? So that's where, you know, if someone is taking a goat and making a Baphomet statue out of it, worshiping Lucifer, obviously that's a polarized negative. Um, <clears throat> but if you're, if you, I mean, come on, let's like, like let's look at it this way. A farmer who has a bunch of goats. Like that doesn't mean they're a Luciferian. You goats know what I mean? Are like hysterical. I love I goats. love goats. Like they're, they're so, so cute. Funny. I've seen I've seen people walk pygmy goats down the street on a leash. That's yeah, like a dog. They're hysterical. They're yeah, I want to really get my funny. dog a goat because I think he would I think that would be just the funniest pair. <laughs> a Ravi and a goat. You know, and owls. Owls were picked by this nefarious bunch because they can see in the dark. Well, guess who made them be able to see in the dark? The original creator. The same Hello. creator who created you. 
You think the owls actually came in and were like, we're going to be representations of evil. No, 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 guys. So we have to, we have to remember, we have to stay grounded and we can't continue propagating this division. Right. And we have to do Stop saying the obelisk is Osiris's wiener. Like the Oscar Mayer wiener car they used to drive around. No, that's not true, guys. That is not true. Do your if research. If it really was that, it wouldn't be pointy all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that looks painful. <laughs> Pretty painful. <laughs> just so, saying. Just saying. So, poor Osiris. I mean, could you imagine if somebody made something and said it was your wiener? Like, poor guy. <laughs> that's, that's not cool. So no, it's an energy. It's an energy antenna guys. It's what it is. And some of most of the original obelisk, which Stephanie and I are going to talk about more in our um, Myrtle Hill cemetery episode, because there are a lot of obelisk and cemeteries for, for particular reasons, which we're going to talk about, but a lot of them are good and they're going to be returned to good. You know, riddle me this. What if some of these original obelisks are going to be what's used to generate Tesla technology? How are you going to feel about that then when you've now been programmed to think they're all bad? And you don't have to pay for electricity. How are you going to look at that? I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to be celebrating that. Me too. Like, and you, we just have to have critical thinking skills. The, the controllers have put us in such a mind screw up that we think we have to have somebody lead us. We think we have to have somebody save us. We think we have to have somebody do it for us. No, if you're still in that mind that place of mental derangement where you think somebody is going to save you or somebody is going to tell you, then, then you haven't done any work, you know, listen to what people have to say, listen to what we have to say, but then go do your own research. That's what I do. I add to that I something to, I want to add, cause we we're talking about this, um, <clears throat> off the recording before we were, when we were chatting, and, you know, it, it's very important for everyone to understand don't go to somebody to figure out who you are. Yeah. Don't pay money to somebody to figure out who you are. I mean, to get your chart read and, and that you really got to trust that person, whoever, like, like I had Tamara read my chart and I trust her, but, um, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, Emmy, you were talking about this. You said people are so desperate to find out who they are. And yeah, you can go to, you know, you can get certain things done like that and everything, but also make sure you're looking in here and doing your shadow work. So you start to remember who you are and, yeah. and even something like a chart reading, it only goes so far. Mm -hmm. It's not going to tell you who you were in a past life or anything like that. That's going to take a little bit of past life regression. And before, you know, we flip into 4D and we get our memories back, that's going to take you as the person starting to filter out the old karmic cycles and doing that shadow work and releasing that energy in order for you to start to figure it out. So don't go to people um, and pay astronomical amounts of money to figure out, you know, who you were in a past life and such. Is that, is that okay for me to say out there? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's important. It's important to use these things as tools. But yeah, exactly. Just a tool. Tools. They're they're not the answer. The answer is in here. Mm -hmm. And if you're not taking the time to meditate and to find yourself, like we are all hidden from ourselves because of all this programming. Someone on the internet who's offering classes is not going to give you the answers. You know, reading a book is not going to give you an answer. Having your uh, chart read is not going to give you all the answers. The answers are in here. And all of those things are tools to help guide you along the way. But people are so stuck in, because of religious programming, they're stuck in this savior complex. Like they're constantly looking to other people to tell them who they are, where they come from, what their mission is. I can't tell you how many times I've had people ask me, well, what's my mission? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out my own mission. <laughs> that is the biggest question I get in readings. And, or I'll get, this resonates with me in a past life. Can you read on this? And I absolutely will. I will not read on people's missions because my readings don't go that far. And I refuse to, even if I could, because I, I do feel like my, my guides have told me, no, no, no. 
It's for the individual person to figure out. It's your responsibility to figure it out on your own. And we have to get into this concept that we don't need an external source to figure out who we truly are. Um, But um, when I do read on past life stuff, I can say, well, I'm getting this in my reading. However, I want you to really sit back and start to really think about it and see if this truly resonates with you. Because again, this is just a tool. So only take what resonates. And one biggest thing I always say to people is do not attach yourself to what I'm saying. If it resonates, great. If it doesn't, then it doesn't. It's just a tool. So like you said, I mean, the the absolute truth lies right in here. It's in our DNA. And why do you think Bryce has been, you've been doing your yoga for how many years and working out? And I just started to do that. And Emmy, I believe you have started to do some sort of regimen as well, because it's then activating the DNA, right? It gets your muscles, all that trapped soul Mm -hmm. energy, you know, to come out and release. So much come up. I have so much come up practicing yoga, like traditional yoga, real yoga. I have been an absolute emotional basket case the last couple of weeks. Like it has been ridiculous. Oh, you go through <laughs> phases of being a crazy person in this practice. I mean, second series, we call it the batshit crazy series because you're in the corner crying. And that's the thing is that even though the body and the spirit are two separate and in things, property of Purusha, they're living in harmony or they're trying to live in harmony within this avatar. And so within your own body, your physical DNA you have information, you know, the, the body is the expression of the soul. It's the Shakti of the soul. And so sometimes though, these, the shadow work, this painful stuff gets so lodged into our psyche that it gets, gets held deep within the body. And when you're doing something like a bar, like pelvic tucks or deep asana work in yoga, it's going to start to like pick the scab of these deeply held things that need to come up. They need to come up in a healthy way. It's not, you don't want to open that Pandora's box, but slowly it needs to like reveal itself. And even though that stuff, I mean, I've had those emotional breakdowns. I've had that happen to me multiple times. It's never ending. It's, you know, you just learn how to handle it better the more and what it is, but it's not comfortable. It's not fun. Every time it comes up, I myself want to run away from the mat. Like you feel that urge to run, you know, but that's, but, but when you sit and you stay, and you lean into it, that's when this wisdom and this, this information starts to come up to you. And it's not like a, it's not like you have to have a recollection of where this stuff comes from. You can, but sometimes you won't. It's just a settling into a feeling. It's just a settling into an emotion. Um, You'll know when it comes up. Yeah, because the motion is the thought, right? The thing that happened to you, the action that happened to you to cause the reaction isn't what's important. It was just something that happened. What's important was what you held on to from that event. And that is what's blocking you and sticking you. And so when it comes, and it's not going to go anywhere. Like these things, the shadow work, isn't just going to magically disappear. And I think that's what people think when they have a state, when they were looking for a savior, is that this stuff is just going to magically disappear. But it's not because there's value in that. Mm-hmm. You agreed to it. That's what we, and I try to express this to people like every stressful <laughs> amount of suffering that you've been through in your life you picked it. And, and that's, that's a power move. Also too, it's part of the experience to get your soul to evolve even to a higher level. So we need to start looking at it in that perspective rather than a punishment, because it's not a punishment. punishment. It's a lesson for your soul then to go up to the next level, which is a rewarding thing. So we need to start looking at it in that perspective rather than why does this always happen to me? Bad things always happen to me. Well, until you come out of that particular mode, yeah, it's going to continue to. Mm -hmm. Well, and the thing too with psychology, just to touch on that a little bit, is that when you have an unhealed wound, you will keep calling in the same repetitive behavior over and over and over again. So like in my own example, which is probably one of the most clearest examples is, you know, we all know that have those girlfriends who date bad men over and over and over again the man changes the outside of the the look changes but the same things same issues keep repeating themselves it's because the person the common denominator hasn't healed something inside of them and the body wants to heal the mind wants to heal so what does it do is it calls forth things that are going to trigger it so that you can then take it and heal it 
yes. you know, that, and that's, that's so, so it's not that things are always happen to me. No, you are calling forth that so that you can actually heal yourself so that you can actually evolve and use that, that suffering to create, it's like the more your heart breaks, the more the light can come in. We can't have light without friction. When you strike a match, you have to actually have that friction, that uncomfortable, that match is probably real uncomfortable being struck against that cardboard, but then poof, there's the light. So stop, 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 stop relying on a leader. Stop relying on someone to tell you what to do. Watch, I watch, watch all sorts of stuff and then I go and research it. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I'm sovereign and I know how to critically think. Yeah. You know? and, and, and part of part of remembering and attaining and getting to a sovereign state is going through this crap. You know, we like what you were saying, Bryce, when uh, a woman has some things to work through and she keeps attracting the same type of man, it's because maybe you know, her voice was taken away as a child and she needs to learn how to speak up for herself. So she's constantly putting out that energy and attracting those types of people to learn that lesson. Yep. And, you know, same thing with me and my husband, you know, I attracted the same kind of guy because I was in a soul contract with myself <laughs> and finally attracted myself. And I had to work through a lot of crap, codependency, trauma bonding. I had to find my voice. My part in our toxicity in the beginning of our relationship, my part was that I allowed it. And I couldn't see that. I couldn't see that for years, years. I was like, I'm not doing anything. Like I was so stuck in victim mindset, so stuck. And it is such a prison. But once you can get over the hump of realizing what your part is in any kind of toxicity and take ownership. I took ownership of the damage that it caused to me, to my children. I took ownership of that. And when I did that, it was the most empowering thing I've ever done is taking ownership for my, the shit in my life. Mm -hmm. And then I did something about it and it was incredibly, um, it was an incredibly courageous thing to do because when you're in a relationship with someone and they're used to a certain kind of situation and you rock the boat, it's not pretty. Yeah. It is not pretty. You know, twin flame relationships are hard and thank you, God, my husband and I are finally in union, but just let me tell you, if you, if you have a twin flame, do your shadow work now, do it now. So that when you come together, you're in a healthier spot. My husband and I were did no shadow work before we got together. We got together. We were both act, in active addiction, different addictions, um, just a mess, an absolute mess. But you know, I think that was part of our contract that we came together before we went through the stuff. Um, you know, everybody's journey is different. But I'm just saying, if you're not in union yet, um, do your work intentionally trigger yourself, mm -hmm. find out who you're resentful at or what you're resentful at work through that. If you have an addiction, find a recovery program. You know, there's millions read a book. You know, there's a lot of things that you can do to grow and better yourself so that you're in a better position for your mate, whether that's, it's a twin flame or a soulmate or whatever. And that's the uh, traditional yoga practice. That's why uh, in a traditional yoga, the teacher does not choreograph the practice. We're taking from the yoga karanta. We're taking from an already established choreographed practice because the postures themselves have an alchemy to them. And they're designed in a certain row, in a certain order to intentionally trigger you and to trigger certain aspects of you. And so like for places where I don't have, like for me in my own experience, places where I don't have any issues in my life, those asanas don't affect me and they're easy for me. They're fun. But when I get to the, the string of asanas, that, that alchemy, that, that pot, that potency, the potion of it all, that's where I start to get triggered. And that's the beautiful thing about the traditional practice is that it's, it's actually designed that way. It's controlled demolition of you. It's controlled demolition of everything that you are, that's stuck in you. And it's been practiced that way for thousands of years. And it's so that through, I mean, I don't know people, I don't know anybody in the Ashtanga world who's had an easy, and that's one thing I get a lot from people like, oh, I just don't like to exercise. Who does? 
Yeah, I don't. <laughs> who does? Me either. I, when people say it to me. I almost like my like, gobsmacked. I'm like, you think I like getting up at three thirty in the morning and doing a two hour intense practice? You think I like putting my head behind my leg behind that multiple times? The reward after it keeps you going and keeps you wanting to do it. And well, when you wake up, Bryce, you made a good point. When you wake up before that six a.m. alarm. And you're doing it before your ego kicks in. You just do it. You don't think about it. See, if I were to wake up at like 7 o'clock a.m., sit, drink my coffee first, your ego starts to kick in and then you put it off, put it, and, and then before you know it, you haven't worked out. Whereas when you wake up, you get your workout clothes on and you just do it. And you're not, you're not thinking about it. So that's the beauty in doing it first thing in the morning. And you, as you said, that's, that's the Brahma Morta time, the time of God from 2 to 6 a.m. That's called Brahma Morta. And so everybody in spiritual practices should be doing something around that time of day, not necessarily 2 in the morning, but at least get yourself up before 6 a.m. because that's the Brahma Morta time. Now, again, the ego, because the ego is, it's the Vata time. So the ego is not really as active at that time. And the ego, the false sense of self, the illusionary sense of self is what will, is, is the thing that fears mortality. Because that's the thing that will go with the body when one day we do pass away. The soul knows it will be alive forever. And so what tends to happen is the ego is what starts talking us out of doing shadow work, doing work on ourselves. Because when the ego has to face shadow work, it's facing its own self. And it's facing its own mortality. And the minute you start to recognize that for what it is, it becomes a power move again because you can recognize it and work through it. And for me, it's like, I mean, 15, almost 16 years later, I, when my alarm goes off every morning, I want to hit that snooze button and not get up, you know, but it's, I'm, un I understand what I'm doing is so much bigger as I taught a class this morning. And as the class was finishing, I, you know, there, I was about to leave to let them take rest. And I said, you know, this practice, because in traditional yoga, you don't lie down in the resting posture, which is not called Shavasana. Stop calling it Shavasana. That's not what that's called. It's like nails on a chalkboard. Shavasana means to literally stop your heart for a second to, to create a, a sense of rigor mortis with pranayama breathing. That's not, this is why you need to be studying with traditional teachers. That's not the correct Sanskrit. Sukhasana is the resting posture. It's the act of no asana. When you take that resting posture, you actually turn your body to face the, the opposite direction of the, the way you were facing when you were practicing. Why? Because you're changing the energy now. You're changing your energy from practice to now post-practice. And as I told my class this morning, even though that practice they just did is now done, it's finished, it's never coming back again, the effects of that practice will stay within them their whole life because you, you've created a, a domino effect spiritually of things starting to open, pathways starting to open within you. And so even every single practice you do, every exercise you do, it's building to something bigger than just that moment. It's, it's getting you in touch with what's stuck, especially in the lower pelvic region where Kundalini lies. I mean, for women, especially growing in a lot of cultures, but especially in the South, this whole region is considered like a no-no zone, right? We're told to like, as women, to like not you know, cross your legs, don't focus on that. But that's where we got to unstick that in order to allow that Kundalini to come. Now, if you have had some trauma in that area, which I won't go into the specifics about that, you guys know what I'm talking about, that can be a very triggering thing to do, but necessary to do because you're unsticking it. And it's just going to follow you from lifetime to lifetime to lifetime until you actually face it. It's not going anywhere. So anyway, with that being said, are y'all ready to get into the shit show? <laughs> ready. <laughs> It's the, the, what, the final countdown. So Emmy, I'm going to let you take it away with your polls for the rest of July. Okay. <clears throat> so we've got some really significant um, conjunctions through the end of July and actually all the way through October, really. Um, so we have Uranus and Uranus is the planet of swift change, revolution, rebellion, um, does not care about traditions, like does not care about longstanding um, behaviors or beliefs, like it is a changer. It is a game changer. And we have Uranus conjunct the North Node. 
And if you guys remember, the last time we talked about North Node, South Node, North Node is where we're going, is where we're growing to, what we're aspiring to. South Node is where we're coming from, we're coming out of. It's like, I use the analogy of slippers, like North Node is like a brand new pair of slippers. South Node is the old pair of slippers. It's familiar. It's comfortable. They're old and ratty. We know we need new slippers, but... It's really hard to do something new. You know, it's everything we always wanted is just outside our comfort zone, yep. you know? So if we get out of our comfort zone and grow. Um, that's, that's kind of the, the energies of the North and South node. So we've got Uranus, which is swift, revolutionary, rebellious change conjunct the North node, which is where we're going. And it's at 18 degrees of Taurus. And Taurus is like, it's our foundation, what we have, what we own, our aesthetic. And Venus is the, the ruler of Taurus. And so we've got re relationships and romance coming in there. We've got financials. So I'm thinking that through the rest of the summer into the fall, we're going to have um, unions being made, uh, twin flame, soulmate. Uh, other unions, I think we might have some breakups, some breakthroughs in relationships. We're also going to continue to see financial instability and shakeup and crumbling of certain things, building up of other things. It's just really chaotic and unstable at this point, but not in a bad way. You know, in order for us to get to where we're going, this stuff has to fall. The stuff has to crumble. It has to be you know, broken down in order for us to rebuild, right? Yep. So, and it's happening all at 18 degrees. And I think there's some significance here to that number. You know, the, what pops into my mind um, initially is that 18 means life. I believe in the um, Hebrew, I might be mistaken. I, I was going to look this stuff up beforehand, but um, I didn't have an opportunity to. So I believe that 18 means life. And it just is so significant with what's going on in the world, where we're going, what's I'm coming. You know. So I just Googled it quickly. I just said 18 spiritual number, meaning it says angel number 18 is a clear sign from divine force or guardian angels that you are doing something right where your spiritual life is concerned. Sit down and consider what changes you want to make for everything to fall into place. This is important to do if you are not at peace with the progress you've made so far. Oh my gosh, that is exactly the energy that's going on with this North Node Uranus conjunction. Exactly. It's like we need to reevaluate, relook at what we want in our life, what we don't want in our life, and just take the uncomfortable move and just go for it. You know, just go for it. Um, this, this kind of energy is really powerful. And the reason being is because Uranus has not been at this degree point ever in our lifetime. This is brand new. Uranus takes 84 years to go around the Zodiac. Last time Uran Uranus was in Taurus was uh, in the late 30s and early 40s. And we know what was going on then, right? You know, big shakeups, big changes, oh. not, so much, not so much for the better, but look at the, co look at the collective consciousness of us now versus then. It's yeah. so different. Yes. Yeah. So different. So, um, and they're going to stay conjunct um, from mid-July until October. So we've got several months of really chaotic, fast-moving, swift changes, like in, in a, on a revolutionary level. So I'm like... I don't want to make predictions and, and whatnot because, you know, so many people have done that and, and been wrong because definitely dates and timelines and things change and whatnot. But as far as astrology standpoint goes, I think that this is the best opportunity we've ha had thus far for something like the EBS or perhaps um, our off-worlder friends showing themselves to us or... Um, this solar flash that they're talking about, you know, something big, something huge, something revolutionary is coming our way. Very, it actually very lines energy. up with Kim Clement and what he said, because <clears throat> he said in a prophecy, strange July, strange July, hypnotic 
November. Ooh. So, already July has been very strange. I mean, look at the guys, stones and all that kind of stuff. So, oops. So, my thing is, hypnotic November, let's think about, like, something trippy. Like, you can see colors brightly and stuff like that when we're talking about hypnotic. Like, you're on some sort of psychedelic, right? To me... Like what you're talking about is all the lineup of stuff until we get to that solar flash and the earth ascends. Because I think when that happens, everything's going to get so much brighter and we're going to be able to read each other's auras and it's going to be a little trippy, a little trippy. Could be like the best acid trip ever. We're just going to huh. dirt twirling like we're at a fish concert. And <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> um. Okay, so like I was saying, Uranus is a new territory for us. Um, and then, then uh, late August, Uranus goes retrograde. So it's going to stay at this point and then go back through to, I think it's 14 degrees of Taurus in January of next year. And then it's going to go forward again. So this whole next like nine months is going to be like a huge shakeup, just a huge shakeup. What else takes nine months? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. Pregnancies. I think there's going to be a lot of like really big, crazy. I just did that in my elemental reading with air signs. I know she texts me because I were both air signs. She's like, girl, you might be getting pregnant soon. I'm like, I'm like, oh my gosh. Huh. I'm not pregnant, guys. Please don't start that rumor. I'm not pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> when she ate grapes the other day, she looked a little bit, maybe about a month or two, because she's so itty bitty. But no, it's just a food. It was a food baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's wild. Yeah. Anyway, but nine months, it takes nine months of, I mean, I've never been pregnant, but I've watched my sister be pregnant. She never, she didn't. See, that's my fear is I don't think I'm going to like being pregnant. Yeah, especially as an RH negative. But my sister, I like watched her go through that. But then at the end of that turmoil of your body changing, you have this amazing gift mm -hmm. that changes your life forever for the better. Yeah, you know? absolutely. It's like the rebirthing process too. So it's like Earth is pregnant, and we're being birthed on the other side of it as new beings. Mm, I like that. That's awesome. Um. Okay, so then in the beginning of August, like the first week of August, Mars joins the party. Mars comes in. Oh, shit. <laughs> Mars comes in and conjuncts uh, Uranus and North Node. Oh, so, so that's going to be a fun week. Buckle up for the first week yeah, of August, everyone. I tell you what, it's like throwing gasoline on an already raging fire of change. So, oh, but let's point on this real quickly because Mars Tuesday is the day of Mars um, and Mars. So Mars is the planet of war guys, if you don't know, and it can be a good, you know, if you look at someone like Mr. T who has a lot of Mars placement, it can be very positive. There's positive and negative aspects to each thing. Um, but it's also in the Hindu faith. That is the day of Hanuman. Hanuman represents Mars. Hanuman is the warrior monkey God who represents your courage your individual courage too. So, and it's so funny when you were, th when you're talking about all of this and we're talking about the changes. I remember my, one of my friends growing up, her dad used to say at the kitchen table when I'd spend the night at her house, he would say to us girls, he'd be like, if fear and failure were not options, what would you do? What would you do? And whatever that answer was, that's what you do. So if you didn't have to contend with fear or the possible failure, what would you do? That's what you do then. That's awesome. I really like that. And that's yeah. your courage. I really like that. Yes. Um, okay. So Mars joins the party. And then um, we've got in the first half of October, we've got Saturn going retrograde in Aquarius, making an almost exact square to Uranus at 18 degrees Taurus. And we know about Saturn. It's about, you know, authority and control structures and matrix, you know, matrix um, and squares are a very 
um, achievement based, driven, very like poke the bear, like light a fire under. So there is just a lot lining up that lends to disclosure, um, you know, huge financial changes, huge relationship changes, huge changes in um, like family pregnancies, unexpected pregnancies. Um, so the rest of this year is going to be crazy guys. <laughs> and it's not, it's not necessarily bad either. It's just going to, it's going to feel uncertain and unstable and chaotic and disruptive. But in order to rebuild something, you have to tear down what was left. And that's, this is the tear down process. So if you can get ahead of this, prepare yourself. Also guys, if you do your own charts, there are, there's a free website called astro.com. You can make a free account, go do your chart, look at your chart, familiarize yourself with your chart. And then once you do that, look at 18 degrees of Taurus in your chart. Everybody has every single zodiac sign in their chart. Whether there's a planet or point there, it doesn't matter. You're going to have a house there. And then if you have no planets or points at 18 degrees of Taurus, look at the house. That is where this energy is going to be concentrated for you. Okay, so you can, by, by using these tools that we have, you can prepare yourself for things so that you're not caught off guard. You don't get bulldozed over or hit with a wrecking ball. You can have, you know, it's not going to make anything any less crazy, but you can be a little bit more prepared. Yeah. You know, and that's so what astrology is like a forecast anyway. It's like your for it's your forecast. And so you, I love that. Yeah. It's like you wouldn't go on a trip without your GPS system. You wouldn't, you know, it's like you, yeah, for sure. For sure. For sure. It's almost like the planets are like, you know, it'd be real fun guys. <laughs> Let's just try this for fun and shake it up a bit. What happens if we do this? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> And this is the point where the off-worlders are like, we're just going to sit back and watch and see what happens. This is the greatest right. reality. Reading popcorn, just like, <laughs> yeah. what's the next thing? We're on the greatest reality show of all time. For the oh, man, right? <laughs> the epic season of next time on Earth, on, on the show Earth. <laughs> As what the world doesn't, <laughs> doesn't turn. The world doesn't turn. The bold and the... What, I'm thinking of all the soap operas. He's a bold of our lives. Bold and the sovereign. The bold and the beautiful. Instead of bold and the beautiful, the um, bold and the sovereign. Yep. The bold <laughs> and the sovereign. <laughs> I mean, you got to laugh about it. That's the thing, guys. I said this in one of my videos. Like when anxiety gets gets rough, you just got to sit back. I posted this on Twitter. I think was it yesterday, where it was like me when I was a young kid. I hope good things happen to me me now as an adult, if bad things happen to me, at least I hope they're funny. You know, like it's just, you <laughs> just got to be able to laugh at this. I saw that. That made me laugh. <laughs> at least I hope they're funny. So, you know, there's always, there's always humor there somewhere. So we can't stop it. We can't like, and I think I've seen that with a lot of people too. And, and I understand this because, you know, I know that most of us on this planet right now are older souls. We had to be in order to be able to survive this. And um, according to the law of one, we had superiority to come to earth because we could, we could survive it. What was happening, we'd be able to handle it, but we do come through a veil of amnesia. And so we don't remember, we don't remember things. And so the only thing we really know for sure in our cognitive thought is the matrix is what we've been born into. And so I think what's happening as well, and I've expressed this before, we want the matrix to fall but we don't actually know what that looks like because we can't remember. And so I think there is a lot of panic because the unknown is the unknown. It's kind of like, you're talking about those new slippers. Like, is this going to hurt my foot a little bit? Like, how am I going to find my footing in this new way of living? We're so conditioned and so secure and it's, and I see this in spiritual growth as well. Sometimes people don't want to leave the old and uncomfortable because it's familiar. Mm -hmm. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. People. I say that to my students all yeah. the time. You get comfortable yeah. with being uncomfortable. Everything you've ever wanted is just outside your comfort zone. Yep. That's so true. There's so many times I've been, you know, I've had a friend or been in some sort of relationship and I'm the type of person like, okay, going on this, this road trip was a little scary for me and everything. And yeah, I did it. And I had anxiety around it because it was a little out of my, it was very much out of my comfort zone. But for the most part, I actually like the thrill of being uncomfortable. Does that make sense? an adventure. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Like, it's just like, 
I feel like if I'm just doing the same old thing every single day, I get super bored, like super bored. And then I become really miserable. We don't want that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny. I pin this on my Twitter. Um, uh, Plot twist of the day. When nothing is certain, everything is possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everything. So. So what else do you have in store for us, Emmy? You're like, Emmy's the one that's going to it right now. Yeah, let, me, <laughs> let me look here. I wrote so many notes down because it's just so exciting. Um, I keep pulling the tower card and the tarot cards. It just keeps Yeah, you know, I, I really think the tower card goes really well with this these next few months for sure. Um, definitely, definitely, definitely. And there's a great quote, um, the opposite of war isn't peace. The opposite of war is creation. Mm. Yes, so absolutely. We're going into a place of creation, but we have to destroy what was, what, what we thought was real in order to recreate what really is real. Mm -hmm. So I, I think another theme that is going to be um, or possibly happen in the next few months is just breaking free from long-term behaviors that aren't for your great highest, greatest good, like addiction. Um, I just think that people are going to get to a point with, and this energy is going to be um, supporting and encouraging people to take that leap. Um, you know, I just, I just really feel like there's going to be a lot of breakthroughs for people on many levels, financial, personal uh, relationships um, with your children. And, and also there's, there's a full moon coming and I think it's in uh, Sagittarius. I'm not sure there's a, a full, no, excuse me, a, a Aquarius. There's a full moon oh, in Aquarius on, on the 13th. <laughs> yeah. And it makes a square to this conjunction, this full moon. So I really think that this full moon is going to be quite, uh, intense and powerful, especially, um, you know, with the qualities of the air signs, you know, we might have a lot of um, emotion and mental, you know, possible brain fog. And, you know, and then when we've got Mars joining the party in the beginning of August, there could be some bubbling up and some explosive anger, maybe outbursts, you know, these kinds of things. So just, just keep that in mind, um, you know, for yourself and for, for other people just to, have compassion on yourself and others and, you know, try not to attach to anything that anybody does or says um, with that type of energy. And, and, and also, you know, Mars is, is, is the God of war, but it's also your drive, your ambition, like, mm -hmm. like the fire behind um, what you want to do, your passion, you know, so it, it could be just a very, very passionate um righteous anger kind of kind of a, an energy yeah so, yeah and i think the full moon is on the 13th i believe that's it's coming not. up it's like wednesday or something and you guys need to pay attention to and i'll say this um we we do this in the a traditional yoga world we don't practice on moon days new or full moon because it creates static and crazy energy so we we take those days as rest days um i would ch double check your area though for what time the, the moon is at its peak for full or new moon. Sometimes they're at their peak in the middle of the day, you know, sometimes with the calendar. So like, for example, for us, if the, let's just say, I don't know when the full moon's at its peak this Wednesday, but let's just say for shits and giggles that it's at this, at its peak at 1157 PM on Wednesday night. Well, the calendar is going to put the moon day on Wednesday then because it's at 1157 PM. So that's technically according to our human time that Wednesday, but we always cancel the practice closest to the pink of the full moon. So that would make the Thursday practice the day off. Now I, I'd have to go back and look to see when it's at its peak, but just be very mindful of that guys. Um, and different t places in the world are going to have different times for the peak, obviously. So just, just start to get familiarized with that because we are 80%, what 80% water as human beings. 
Um, I just did that. I just read the Quan Yen activation for the Sophia code. She talks a lot about the baptism of water, how important water is and the moon, just like it affects the oceans, it affects us, whether that's the real moon or not, doesn't matter. It still affects us. And so part of being able to navigate spiritual stuff like this is, is like, is what Emmy is saying is to having an understanding of what emotions are going to possibly arise and knowing why they're arising. You know, if it's, if it's a trigger that needs to come up, then allow it to come up and don't project it, deal with it yourself, but just to understand what you're working with as a human being, right? That's part of the education that they've taken away from us in this system is to understand we're part of this, the moon, the stars, everything, we're, it's all part of us. It's like the story of Krishna, Govinda, when he was a child and he puts dirt in his mouth and his mother comes to wipe off the dirt out of his mouth and she sees the whole universe inside of him right? That's you too. You are the macro and you are the micro. And so when you start to understand that and lean into it, it gives you, puts you in a place of power, you know, and, and, a, and it gives you a fighting chance to use these elements. Cause even, even, even though we're seeing this happening to everyone, it's happening to you for a reason you agreed to it. Right. So that's your power. Just be aware, just look alive. I pulled a, full, a couple cards on the energies revolving around the rest of July into early August. If you guys want to see those real quick. Of course. <clears throat> yes. Because they very much align with the energies you are talking about, Emmy. So for starters, we're going to get a lot of people who are going to really truly want to run away from probably themselves. Honestly, you get into these uncomfortable energies. <clears throat> and the first thing you think of, especially being programmed the way we're programmed is run away, especially you talk about this a lot, Bryce, in the Western world, we're very much programmed to just run away. But we can also look at this energy too as um, we're, we're also coming out of troubled waters as well, because the Six of Swords talks about coming out of troubled waters. It's some sort of movement, in other words. Um, this also could be talking about movement in terms of white hat moves. Like we might start to see more and more come out instead of the little trickle of information because swords are information, they're words and thoughts. We could be looking into things are now coming more out into the um, public eye. We also have uh, Bryce's favorite card, which is the Ace of Cups energy where we're talking about possible, um, there's a lot of um, passionate emotions coming out. <clears throat> and also to the Ace of Cups is a lot about uh, new beginnings, um, passionate new beginnings. Um, so we can be relating that to twin flame soul, uh, soul um, mate type of unions occurring. Um, so there's that energy. There's also this energy of the Four of Cups. And the Four of Cups is talking about a lot of um, we could be seeing a lot of things that really kind of just make us, puts us in a state of disappointment. Um, but that doesn't mean, um, <clears throat> that's probably more or less talking about us coming out of our comfort zone. Something is uncomfortable is kind of what I'm getting from that. Because we do have this energy of the world. And that's talking about um, major permanent changes because the world um that particular one is a major arcana so it's not a little change it's a change that's going to rock your world whether it's for the good or for the bad i'm actually getting positive changes though because we do have this energy re revolving around the ten of cups which is talking about family it's talking about reproduction it's talking about um happiness so we are going into all these different changes that are for our greatest and highest good, but I'm also getting a lot to do with the family unit. There's going to be a shaking of the family unit. And you were just talking about that. I mean, so these totally line up and those are the cards that I did choose. So. Awesome. I love, I love doing shows just on the fly and not scripting anything and seeing how everything pulls together with our different intuitive knowings and, it's just the coolest. <laughs> we do. We all have different gifts and some of us might have similar gifts and stuff, but the beauty of having different gifts, which I don't like to copy anybody because I just want to be my own unique person. And like, I mean, you bring to the table a lot of your astrology stuff and a lot of like you're into the energy healing, the Reiki stuff. And I'm into the, a lot of the divination and Bryce, you bring into the factor a lot of, um, 
your Eastern philosophy tools in your toolbox, you know, even though you do divinate too and everything, but you are so knowledgeable in how energy is transmuted. Like you, you definitely like an alchemist in a way, because you know how to transmute the energy by the whole, all the yoga stuff that you are teaching and <clears throat> all of that stuff that you bring to the table. And when you have all these people with all these different gifts, bringing things to the table, and then you are collaborating together it really is magic. It, it is magic. It's and really magic. It That's amplifies and solidifies everything that each one of us says. Yeah. It's so supportive and um, <laughs> similar in nature. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Yeah. I love it. it is, and that's, I think we were all, you know, I believed, I personally believe that any human being can do anything they want to do, but we're all given different, um, dreams and aspirations for a reason because it's, it's nudging you down a path down your dharmic path your dharmic path is 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 your inheritance it's your it's your spiritual inheritance is what you it's, your, it's like your major arcana right it's like what you decided to do before you came into this this world and um and we all get there eventually and when we can honor each other's dharmas um and work together with our own then that's when you're powerful instead of trying to use each other's dharmas we're we're just, we're working together with what we know we're good at. And, and that's, and there's a reason why I'm not teaching math. You know, there's a reason why I would never be teaching math. Oh my God. <laughs> oh man. I used to hate all, I, I like geometry. That was the one math I actually liked, but all my math classes throughout all my educational system, it was almost like I would get in such a bad mood before those classes. I just, you know, it's just, that was not ever going to be in my in my wheelhouse, but, um, you know, but we all have different, like I've taken, um, Reiki one and Reiki two courses just so I wouldn't understand it. I knew, I knew, I knew intuitively that I would never use it as a modality for me and always knew as yoga and going to India and studying from that perspective, but I took it just to understand it, you know? And, and so I can promote people like Emmy and my friend, Tiffany and Cindy, these people who actually use it. I can promote that because I understand, I understand what they're doing, even though I don't do it, I understand it. And so, um, and so, you know, it is that, and I think that's the world we're walk, walking into as well, where everybody, you know, the Sean Stone said this once on a show I did with him, where he talked about how the controllers have set up this like dog eat dog world, that there's a not enough for everybody and that you have to fight to get to the top, but that's not true. Every human life is valuable. Every human life has a gift. And I think because of the programming, we're still in this mentality where we have to like outdo each other. But I think we're starting to see that that's not the case at all, that we all have a purpose. We all have a gift and we all are supposed to be working together as one collective whole. Um, and that's why it works, you know, mm -hmm. and have fun doing it. Yeah. Hard work doesn't have to be boring or stressful. It can be fun too. Yeah. I feel like there's always like this, this energy of competition, especially in the awakening process too. It's like, I, I often have people come to me for their readings and they're like, well, I'm not as far ahead as you. And I said, no, 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 no. You're as far as you need to be in this now moment. There's people behind you. There always will people behind you. There will always be people ahead of you. I said, don't word it that way because what I'm doing is not what you're going to be doing. You might be far ahead of me in another thing. Yeah. And you know what I mean? So never compare yourself to other people and where they are in a process of something. Don't compare, don't compare your chapter one to somebody else's chapter 10. And I say this, I said this this morning to a new student I had, and I said, you know, she, cause I get new students sometimes and they become very apologetic for being new. And at first of all, I'm like, I took my first class at one point as well. Like I, I'm not, but I, I've said this before as a teacher, um, if, if you guys feel like you're not, you know, as far along as you need to be spiritually, the easiest people to work with and teach are the beginner students and the advanced students, because both the beginner student and the advanced student know that they know nothing. Right. So if you feel like you're new, congratulations, you're on the same page as an advanced student right now. Remember this feeling, because when you go through that intermediate phase, that's when you become the asshole and the ego kicks in. Right. And then that ego gets smushed and you go back and you go back into that other realm of being like, I, I'm still learning myself. We're all still learning. We're all still learning more and more and more and more and more. So, yeah, you're right. We're all where we need to be when we need to be. You're not late to the party. This is what you agreed to. 
you sat it's down. It's all designed for your soul contract, whatever, whatever little line you signed with God before you incarnated, that's where you're going to be. You're not going to be a day late. You're not going to be a day early. You're going to be right on the dot where you need to be in that moment that you agreed upon. I have nothing to do with it. Emmy has nothing to do with it. Bryce has nothing to do with it. You do as your soul who contracted the contract, right? Wrote up the contract. Mm -hmm. So I have an affirmation for everybody. My friend Holly uh, taught me this a few years ago and it goes, I am exactly at the right place at the right time with the right people doing and saying the right things. I say that to myself every single day. You know, I have a, a group of affirmations that I like to say, and I'll, I'll change it up. I used to say a whole bunch, but now I just pick three and I'll say each of them three times. And the next day I'll pick three, but that particular um, affirmation I say every day, it, I just, I love it. I'm exactly in the right place at the right time with the right people no accident. doing and saying the right things. I mean, yeah. it's amazing how quickly your day, things can change in a day. Yeah. How quickly. I mean, I, rolls it. yeah, that things can just change in a day for you. And I love that Emmy because it's true. And I know most people watching right now can look back at your life and look back at times in your life where you wanted something to happen and you're waiting and, but it didn't happen for a while. And when, when it happened, you look back and you realize it happened when it needed to happen because all the others, these other things had to come around as well. And so it's, it's, you know, thank God we're not in charge of this show. Thank God our higher selves are in charge of this show because we would have all screwed it up by now if we were working from our lower <laughs> selves, right? Like we wanted this flip to happen two years ago, but as, as, as hard as, it, as it's been, there are things that had to happen when they had to happen in order for the, the, the highest good of all of humanity. And so well, even the 17th letter of the alphabet back channel says they're, they just, they just put a post out. I mean, they just did a drop. And someone asked, are you going to be making your move soon? Or however he said it. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> um, right where he needed to be when he needed to be there. Exactly. <laughs> here I am talking squirrel. <laughs> so, um, okay. And so the military back channel responded. It had to be this way. We don't know what that reason is yet. Honestly, personally for me, I would have really hated it if, we flipped two years ago and I wasn't fully awake yet. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So the emperor knew there were things that had to be done under, under the surface. And we know that we know that that's why you're right. I mean, a lot of people have put dates out, but it's like, guys, we're in an active war right now. They're not going to put the real dates out. Yeah. The dates are just dates. It. They're just dates too. Dates are man-made. Anyway, we're looking at astrology. Astrology is the real time. Astrology is yeah. the real calendar right which so, is why the church took away astrology oh yeah the hess act read the hess act guys that's if you think astrology is of the devil do your research read the hess act it's not you feel like it when i read the hess act i felt even though i was already into astrology i felt like a right doofus when i read the hess act i was like oh this is propaganda yeah. right this is literally believing astrology is of the devil our tarot cards are of the devil it's literally believing in nazi propaganda mm -hmm fact that that is exactly right you're not exaggerating at all Bryce is not exaggerating seriously yeah. guys look it up if you if you haven't looked it up please look it up do your research don't take anybody's word don't take our word for anything go look this shit up yourself that has seriously, that. it's very you. empowering yeah. it's very empowering just google it I had, someone, <laughs> I had someone say to me the other day I'm not going to say who it is because it's someone very close to me <clears throat> I don't know how to research. And I said, you know, I forgot what I said, but it was just like, that made me really think for a second. See, I like to research. Now, most of the stuff that I put out there is not research because I collaborate with you a lot, Bryce, or you, Emmy. So when I'm divinating, the less I know, the less my ego is in my channeling and that's the only reason I don't do as much research anymore because when I first got into this whole thing oh my god it was like I I couldn't put the book down I couldn't put the computer down because I was like constantly like diving into one thing after the next after the next after the next and so 
I do personally like to research. Um, but it just kind of shocked me. Like someone saying, I don't know how to. It's very easy. And it doesn't, and, and people ask, well, well, what do, how do I know it's on a correct platform? What you do, Bryce, is you take it from many different platforms, different commentary, different, <laughs> he's adorable, um, <laughs> different places, and then you form your own opinion, right? I even, I, I intentionally listen to commentary from Harvard professors. I don't ignore, I'm, I'm not going to censor anything. I want to hear what the narrative is. And then I go look at the counter narrative. I look through lawsuits. I spend days on one topic and one topic alone. Now, sometimes the research is really easy. Like again, the Hess Act, it's easy. You look it up, you read it, you're like, oh, it's right there. Mm -hmm. You know, some stuff is a little bit more complex and takes a little bit more time to go through everything. But yeah, nobody's handing me a script when I research. I just go through everything and see all different opinions. I take notes on all different opinions. I compare and contrast. And then I have, and I try to be really good about saying, in my opinion, this is what yeah. the truth is from what I have seen um, and what I know so far about what is hidden and what they, what their agenda is. So um, yeah, anybody can research. If the only thing you need to know how to do, the only thing children need to be taught how to do is to read and to write. After knowing how to read and write, you can teach yourself anything. Mm -hmm. It's all out there and it's easy for us now. Yes, libraries are still very important. I don't want libraries. To, we need books. We need all those books. But right now we are, they, they've created the internet to try to control us, but they've also, it's also a tool for liberation. You just have to know what search, ins to, search engines to use and you have to be able to dig and dig and dig and dig. <laughs> Patents are awesome to look up as are studies, but you really need to um, figure out who funded the study and see, make sure there's no conflict of interest. Um, and, and a lot of times, you know, people don't know how to read a study. It's really important. Read the study. Look up patents. Patents are extremely revealing, mm -hmm. extremely revealing. I looked up the patent for um, the thing here. And uh, I was blown away and I tried to share this information with so many people and nobody even wanted to look at it. It's like, look at this stuff. This is okay. not what this is not what they're saying it is. People don't like to take the blinders off. Yeah. You know that I read the ingredients in that concoction and there was this chimpanzee and then this really long word. And I went and looked up that word and I was like, oh, monkey shit. They put monkey ship in this shit, in this concoction. We're being careful what we say. And then what's the next um, version of this recipe that just came out? Monkey pox. From monkey shit. It's in the concoction. Like, and you just have to look up the ingredients. It's right there. And if you don't know a word, like I didn't, I just went and looked it up. What does that word mean? BC. Oh, reading ingredients? That's something I started to research. Reading ingredients on like, I don't know, boxes of cereal or your your craft macaroni and cheese and um, stuff like that. I mean, there's going to be a bunch of stuff where you're like, I can't even pronounce this word. They do that purposely because they know most people are too lazy to look up what that means to go, oh, well, must be safe because the government says so. Mm -hmm. No, look it up because you're, you're like, look up what's in red food dye and if you have a kid who is deemed autistic or adhd and he has a has a behavior problem which i just label as okay they're probably a star seed you know see how they act after they get red food dye i'm mm -hmm. Bryce, you got an opportunity to see that and, and tyler because he well we didn't eat the healthiest on the trip but look up what's in red food dye and then you're going to understand why your kid is going batshit crazy after they eat a bag of Doritos. I love Doritos. There are alternatives, Bryce. We know that you are the 10 year old with a debit card type of eater, snacker. <laughs> <Get off. laughs> I was surprised, guys, she wasn't farting out rainbows after, okay? I was I mean, very I love Skittles. I'm not a chocolate fan. And the rest is like Reese's with peanut butter, but I love me some Skittles. I love, I like Cool Ranch Doritos though, even though apparently they- Those were my favorite over the, the, the nacho. Yeah, I like the Cool Ranch, but there is all organic alternatives that I have found. 
I love Cheetos too. Get your fingers all. <laughs> yeah. This is why I'm the cool aunt. All right. This is why I'm the cool aunt. When Aunt Bryce babysits, Aunt Bryce doesn't know how to cook. So guess what? We we eat Doritos and Skittles. <laughs> <laughs> Never sending my kid to you for a day. <laughs> I took last year for my niece's birthday. I took her to Target for a shopping trip. So she didn't get a couple of toys and we got to the checkout. I was like, Jacqueline, you want to get some candy? It's your birthday. And she couldn't decide between two. So I let her get both, both of them. And then I had her eat it in the car before we got to her back to my <laughs> It's like, here, handing back to you. Have fun with that. I was like, well, here's the next game, Jacqueline. We're going to eat all this candy before we get back to your house. And we're going to keep this a secret from your mom. <laughs> no, oh my I used gosh. To know, when my nephew was really little, he's the firstborn. He, when I lived in Buckhead, he would come over to my, my apartment because the train would run. He loved trains. And this was back when he was still wearing diapers. <laughs> and my sister would leave him with me for a couple of hours. And towards the end of his time with me, before she would pick him up, I'd always let him eat raisins. <laughs> And then I get a call from my sister like an hour later. She'd be like, what the hell did you feed this kid? Because the, the diet it would just be a blowout. Oh, my like, gosh. I this cold is clean. He got, and at least it's a fruit. It was, oh, my <laughs> God. It at Aunt Bryce's house. So, Oh, my God. <laughs> they don't even call me Aunt Bryce. I don't know. If, I think they call their dad's siblings aunt and uncle, but they just call me Bryce. I think they think I'm one of the, one of the cousins. I don't know. <laughs> one of the kids. One, one of the kids. The kids. She's the fun one, so we're, we're going to leave out aunt. I'm not married. I don't have any kids of my own. They're like, oh, yeah, she's one of us. She's one of mm -hmm. us. I, I, would sit at, I would sit at the kitty table way back when uh, at big Thanksgiving Christmas dinners. I'd sit at the kitty table with the oh, kids. Sure. I know. A better conversation. <laughs> I know, right? Right? I, I was labeled a fun aunt, too. Yeah. I, I mean, when I was really little... Um, they would not, we had a kitty table, but you know, in the, the holidays, it's all like casseroles and all that kind of stuff. And I hated that as a kid. I hated the casseroles. I just wanted the desserts. But then as more cousins came along, they started to create a separate menu for the kids. And so the kitty table was way more fun because it was better food too. <laughs> mm -hmm. So oh gosh, guys, it's almost quarter to two. I know. We have to <laughs> on. I've had so much fun. Let's plan another one real soon. But guys, Please know if you're feeling the roller coaster of emotions, you're not alone. And we, we, we can't escape it. Like we, the whole world, there's really nowhere to escape. Like we're all going to go through this. Every single human being on this planet is going to go through this. And so take solace in knowing that you are not alone. If you are feeling overwhelmed, please reach out and talk to someone. Hopefully everybody has at least one person in their life that they can vent to, um, that they can talk with that, that, you know, take some time for yourself, exercise, stay grounded. And just know that this is something we have to pass through. We can't go around the storm. We have to go through it. All right. Just like that lotus flower uh, blooms on top of the mud. We have to go through that mud in order to bloom. And um, just hold on and know that you were made for this. That's mm -hmm. why you're here. That's why you're here. Why you're here. Guys, I'm going to put out a couple of Reiki videos on my channel. One for increasing clairvoyance and another for relieving stress. Okay, so I'll, I'll put that out. Reiki is a living energy. So you can listen or watch the video over and over and over and it will still heal you. It will still provide the benefits and the energy. Um, so I'm going to do that this week. Um, so text me when you have them up and me and I'll share them on my community tab and on my Twitter. Same. Same. Okay. Okay. So when I, again, I'm going to put their links to their channels, guys, down in the description box below. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Um, what I love about Emmy's channel too, and of course, Stephanie has her healing modalities with the readings and stuff, but channels like Emmy's, and like our friend Cindy, they're constantly putting stuff out to help you work tools to help you work through this. And so go ahead and hit that subscribe button for both of them guys so that you can, um, you can, you can, I love Stephanie's elemental reads because it helps you get clarity for what's coming specifically for you um, in a very general sense, because you're sharing it with two other signs as well for whatever elemental you are, air, earth, fire, or water. Um, and of course the Reiki is amazing. I love Reiki. It's been a part of my life for a very long time now. So um, Reiki, it is living energy and it is the true healing modality. And what I think we're going to go back to is more of Reiki and stuff like that. So, all right, ladies. Well, thank you so much for joining me today in this last minute shindig. 
So I feel like we're in the three of cups right now, even though it's shit's about to get crazy. We're like, we're just going to party through it. It's like when the yeah. team was seeking and they were still playing the, playing the violin. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, guys, we will get through this and it'll be worth it at the end. So we love you all. And we'll talk to all of you guys very, very soon. Bye guys. Bye. Thank you.